Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on addressing the COVID-19 pandemic. For over 30 years, the focus of the National Organization for Rare Disorders has been the health and well-being of people living with rare diseases and their loved ones. We want you to know that today our commitment to serving you is stronger than ever. We're living through challenging and unprecedented times with the COVID-19 pandemic. NORD is working hard on a number of fronts to provide medically accurate facts and to offer reliable information from trusted sources in order to empower our community. We will be here for you throughout this pandemic. My name is Katie Kowalski. I work in the Education Department at NORD, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's webinar. We're glad you could be with us today. I've mentioned that NORD is dedicated to improving the lives of people with rare diseases. Our team is extremely active at this time. We are posting position guides and other resources to answer your questions about COVID-19. NORD's Patient Services Department is providing direct support to hundreds of families each day. Our membership team is sharing resources with advocacy groups to bolster their efforts during the COVID-19 crisis. Our policy team is advocating for policies to ensure that people with chronic conditions have access to essential medications and supplies. And our education team will be bringing you more educational events such as today's webinar. So please visit our web website at rarediseases.org and follow NORD on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to access materials and keep informed of events. And now it's my privilege to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Marshall Summer is the Chief of Genetics and Metabolism and the Director of the Rare Disease Institute at Children's National Hospital. His division sees over 8,000 rare disease patients each year. Dr. Summer is well known for his pioneering work in caring for children with rare diseases and for his laboratory work leading to treatments for patients with genetic diseases. He is currently the Chairman of NORD's Board of Directors. Dr. Bernhard Wiedermann is a specialist in pediatric infectious diseases. His research and clinical interests include pediatric infections, unexplained fever, infections in immunocompromised patients, medical education, educational technology, and evidence-based medicine. Dr. Albert Friedman is a licensed psychologist with over 20 years of experience providing psychotherapy for individuals, couples, and families. Dr. Friedman is also a rare caregiver. His 24-year-old son, Jack, lives with spinal muscular atrophy. Dr. Friedman speaks at conferences nationally on challenges facing families of children with special health care needs and provides consultation to health care organizations and schools. We are honored to have you with us here today, and we look forward to hearing from each of you. And now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Summer to get us started. Thank you so much for that introduction. And Alan Budd, it's a pleasure to share the mic with you today as we talk about some of the responses to COVID-19, particularly in the rare disease community. So let's just go ahead and write on in from that um, introduction. One thing I would like to say is the team here at Children's National and our Rare Disease Institute and our genetics program I want to reach out to all the families out there and all of the patients out there and just say we are thinking about you. We hope you all safety and wellness and during this particularly challenging time. So our thoughts are with you. Now, I'm showing you these two images for two very good reasons. One, during the Blitz during World War II, um, they put up a lot of posters called Keep Calm and Carry On. It had to do with a lot of things. but I think part of the message there is that while there's a lot of scary stuff going on right now, and if you watch the media, it can even make that more so, we still have to live our daily lives. Um, our patients with rare disease still need to take care of themselves, still need to do their treatments, and still actually have medical issues to deal with. So in the spirit of carry on, that's something we certainly do. The other thing is one of my favorite quotes from Marie Curie. Well, Madam Curie, as she was known, was an obvious incredible physicist who discovered radium, a number of things about radioactivity. And her point was, yes, there's nothing really you should fear, but 
you should try to understand what it is. And I think one of the things we need to try to do is understand what's going on and understand how best to respond to it. So let's talk about a couple of things. First thing is most rare disease already comes with a greater risk than everyday life in COVID-19. Most of the patients I've had the pleasure to work with over the last 35 years have conditions that present significant health challenges. While the statistics on COVID certainly would pose risk, the statistics on rare disease and health risk, I think actually probably in some ways are greater. So these are things we're kind of used to dealing with. The rare disease community has dealt with risk for many years. Our folks have a better than average coping skill. The patients and families I know are some of the most resilient people on the planet. That should continue through this time. And while there are things for us to learn about how COVID-19 and how this period affects us, we actually have a lot of things to teach everyone else about how to deal with health uncertainty, how to deal with risk, how to deal with an uncertain future. So in some ways, we can actually be great teachers for the rest of the world. And the other thing, we can help make changes that benefit our community and countless others during this time. There are improvements in our healthcare system. There are improvements in the way we, we do things in responses. There are lessons to learn here that both the rare disease community and others can learn. Well, how does COVID-19 affect the rare disease community? Well, who's at greater risk? What can we do about it? How do we manage complex medical conditions when panic is in the air? And how do we change the medical paradigm to help now and later? Let's talk about risk first. To date, the statistics, and Dr. Riederman will speak on this more than I can, and he's much more of an expert, but the younger a patient, the less effect COVID-19 seems to have. There's a number of molecular biology and virology reasons for this, but we do see mild disease so far in our younger patients. Now, there are going to be exceptions to that, but that seems to be kind of what we're seeing. Older patients with underlying medical conditions are at greater risk for severe disease particularly with those with immune and respiratory illness. And many of our rare diseases impact both those systems, so that's something we need to be aware of. Patients on immunosuppression have a greater risk. Those of you who've had transplants, those of you who've had family members who are on immunosuppression for different things, this poses a slightly greater risk. What do you do about it? So it's easy to point that out. But we need to think about what sorts of things we can do to not only protect ourselves, but also to deal with this in a rational way. So the first thing is listen to those public announcements about social separation, staying away from others, and self-quarantine. Many of you, this is familiar. If you have a rare disease that affects the immune system or biochemical systems, you've been told before during cold and flu season, you need to stay away from those who have it. Well, it's kind of the same thing here. Make sure you have refills and a good stock of all medicines. One of the biggest concerns right now are medical supplies. Um, I'm not saying panic. I'm not saying rush out and clear the shelves off. But do make sure you've got a couple of refills in hand. Um, unlike toilet paper, having your medicines in hand can help stave off a disaster, or at least certainly a lot of worry. So make sure you've got plenty of things on stock. Check to see if your regular hospital is diverted non-COVID-19 patients elsewhere. One thing we're seeing in some of the more harder hit cities is that certain hospitals are being designated for COVID-19, certain for non-COVID-19. Find out which hospital you go to. It may not be your regular hospital. Then figure out who's going to take care of you when you get there, who can you get information to that will need to know about your rare disease, will need to know about your condition in case you have to go in. Make sure you work with your regular healthcare team and make sure your treatment letters are up to date. Communication is absolutely key here. Make sure yours is in place and that you're ready to go. So how do we manage a complex medical condition when everyone around us seems to be panicking? Well, first, don't panic. Uh, you've dealt with things like this before. You know how to deal with them now. Stop, think, and plan. If you do have to go to the hospital, plan ahead. Visitation is limited. Some rooms they're allowing no one, some only one family member. Make sure you've got phones, tablets, portables, and plenty of chargers. In my rounds last week, I ran across a number of families where one had a charger and the other didn't, and they were falling out of communication with each other. Have a kit ready to go to the hospital 
if that's a frequent stop for you. Take a supply of your medication. If the facility you're going to isn't used to you, they may not have your rare disease medications there. They may not um, know your formulas, so take them with you. The distribution network's probably going to be a little slower than normal, so getting those things transferred around once you're there may be harder than usual. So be prepared. You're going to be able to help out the healthcare system that way. Be as self-sufficient as you can. Don't let fear drive you to the emergency room. Be objective about symptoms, read the warnings and when you should go and what they are. Emergency rooms will be crowded. If admission is a must, then discuss with your team a direct admission. But also don't let fear drive you away either. If you need to, get treated. If you have regular treatments that you need to get, go ahead and get them. Your team's going to take a lot of precautions anyway, so you should be pretty safe doing that. But don't go the other way and not get treated when you need to. Lots of people are going to be wearing masks wherever you go. The rules on this and the recommendations seem to change a lot. Don't freak out by this. If you need one, um, they'll tell you usually where you're going. Uh, you may or may not. So just be aware that some places you'll need a mask, some places you won't. You're also going to find the clinics you go to may be a little more chaotic than normal, and also that the folks working there may be a little bit more hassled or a little bit more harassed. So I think a little bell of the patience and kindness is something we all want to extend them because a lot of them are encountering things they may not have before. Let's talk about changing the medical model in the middle of a pandemic. And there's a great Winston Churchill quote, never let a good crisis go to waste. I do not wish this upon us at all, but we need to see if there are changes we can make in our healthcare system that will benefit all of us over the long term. Telemedicine is one of the big ones there. It is and can be your friend. If someone doesn't absolutely have to poke, image, or lay hands on you, see if you can do your visits by remote. Um, you need to be the center of your medical care, not your medical center. And I think that's a message we carry forward. Uh, regulations like cross-state licensure are easing. Nord's playing a big role in that through the Rare Action Network and others, working along with HHS, and we're trying to get the governors in the different states to make sure that your healthcare expert can take care of you where you are. Um, this is a good opportunity to find out what parts of your regimen are habit and what parts are necessary. I have patients I like to see just because I like to see them every year, and now is probably not the time for social and medical visits. So look at what you're doing, work with your team, figure out what you absolutely need to do and what you may be better off waiting to do later or can do by remote care. Program like NORD's Undiagnosed Registry and the I Am Rare program are places you can store data and it belongs to you. Think about those and if you work with a patient advocacy group, see if they've got a registry. Information that we're collecting right now I think will be useful in the future, but also that's how we learn more and more about rare diseases. So explore those and look into them. So this is some shots actually from our telemedicine program. So we're actually doing a couple of hundred uh, telemedicine visits a week with different patients. The families seem to love it, actually. Um, we found for some of our kids, the ones that get spooked when they come to a hospital, looking at them at home seems to be a lot more fun for the kids. In fact, sometimes the parents are trying to chase around and keep up with them, and it gets hard to do. Uh, the dog, actually, is just a shot one of our families took while we were doing a telemedicine. Visit. And then the young lady just wanted to show us her new baby brother, are right there in the middle. So telemedicine is, I think, a very good option. See what parts of it you can use for your health care, and that's something we should hang on to going forward in the future. Final thought. If you're not a member of NORD, why not? This is a great time to join. You can read and learn. If your rare disease group isn't a member of NORD, you really ought to think about joining up. There's a lot of benefits. It's an umbrella organization that provides a lot of care, a lot of information, and a lot of leverage for small groups. Remember your healthcare team. They're stressed. I walk around the hospital here. I see a lot of the young doctors. They look worried. If you can, reach out to your team. Let them know you're thinking about them and vice versa. When a vaccine's ready for COVID, take it. Um, if it's a good one, make sure it's safe. We'll go through the process on that. But just like we recommend flu vaccines for our patients, we're going to be recommending COVID vaccinations as well, too. There are obvious exceptions on that. 
your dog's going to know what they are. Stay informed, but don't let it drive your fear. The 24-hour news cycle can really work you up. Be careful about how much of that you consume and how much of it affects you. Use the knowledge to prepare. Don't use the knowledge to be afraid. We'll get through this. Doesn't mean it's going to be quick or easy. We've got a long road ahead of us. But this is a community that can handle this better than almost any community in the world. Thanks for letting me talk to you today. I really appreciate you uh, logging in and taking the time. It is my great pleasure now to introduce one of my colleagues, Dr. Bud Wiederman. Bud is one of my go-to people for infectious disease with what's going on. And Bud's going to talk to you a little bit now about some of the basics of COVID and things we're looking at. Bud, you're on. Thanks very much, uh, Marshall. Um, as you can see, I am a pediatric infectious diseases specialist. Uh, and I will say uh, the people in my profession uh, are the ones who train from the get-go for things like this. Uh, and I will say, although this is, you know, the current uh, outbreak is unprecedented in many respects, uh, it also made me recall my first outbreak, which was in 1981. I was still in training at the time, uh, but I was called on to help out with an investigation team of an outbreak of uh, very severe meningitis. Uh, and I remember a lot about it, including being scared. Uh, so that's okay. Uh, but if you're armed with uh, knowledge about what to expect and what's going on, I think that can mitigate uh, in many uh, respects the, the fears that we all feel. So with that, I'm going to co try to cover a few things today. A little bit, I'm not going to turn you into virologists, but hope to get you up to speed understanding some of the terminology. Talk a little bit about how to stay safe. Uh, a little bit about masks and other personal protective equipment. I'll do my best to predict the future, uh, and then I'll, I'll close and just leave you, and that'll be uh, posted after the talk, with some uh, resources on the web that I think are uh, excellent and reliable, uh, so you have that to refer to. So, first off, coronaviruses. A little bit about the nomenclature. The disease itself is called COVID-19. Um, and as you know, it's fever, cough, and or some respiratory symptoms. And not really much on the surface to distinguish it from other respiratory illnesses. Uh, although one thing that's come up uh, recently and might be real is some individuals experience a change in how they taste or smell different things. So that's the disease. The virus that causes it is called SARS-CoV-2, which isn't a very convenient term, but let me put all this in perspective. First of all, coronaviruses, uh, there are several hundred of them, uh, almost none of which infect humans, uh, but around four or so of them uh, are common every winter and they cause the common cold, no big deal. Um, but there have been two instances uh, prior to COVID-19 where coronaviruses have sort of jumped from animals into humans and created some very unique circumstances. So the first one was the original SARS, 2002 to 2003, starting in China. Um, and it lasted about six months. It was a very severe disease, but for reasons unknown, it was pretty much gone after six months without any treatments or vaccines being developed. Contrast that with something called MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, 
which started in 2012 and is still with us. It's mostly in Middle Eastern countries. There have been some travel associated cases in many countries, but it really hasn't taken off in other countries. So a very different circumstance. And I just mention that because now as we deal with COVID-19, it may also behave differently. We don't know yet. What about safe medical care? So uh, Dr. Summer sort of alluded to the fact is you, you uh, any families that have individuals with chronic conditions, rare diseases, whatever, uh, often have plans to manage during different illnesses. So what, what we're dealing with now uh, in terms of what you've experienced before is most like influenza, but the big difference between COVID-19 and the flu is, first, we don't have a vaccine or any specific treatment for COVID-19. Secondly, none of us out here are immune to this, um, so we're all at risk. Uh, and thirdly, we don't know if it's going to behave seasonally, meaning, you know, like most respir respiratory viruses, is it going to go away in the summer, more or less, and be worse in the winter? Uh, can't predict that yet. But regardless of that, uh, as Dr. Summer was saying, uh, you need to get a plan. Where are you going to go for office visits? What's your go-to emergency room? Uh, where might somebody be hospitalized? And how are they set up to deal with COVID-19? As he said, in especially some of the larger cities that have been hit hard, uh, different hospitals are designated for different things. And there may be selected COVID-19 hospitals. The way to figure all this out is really to go to your provider because uh, they know uh, uh, your family member with rare disease, they know the family, uh, they'll be able to best advise you about developing a management plan. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, to check with your main providers. All right, what about shopping? Uh, and I'm sort of dealing with this. Uh, we all are. Um, delivery services and online shopping can, can be a real help. Uh, sometimes also a little more expensive, but that's great. Uh, if you do need to visit a store, try to shop at off hours and certainly, uh, find out some businesses will have special accommodations for high-risk individuals. So I count in the high-risk group because of my age, and I know some of my area supermarkets have special hours earlier in the morning where uh, just people who are in the older age group can do shopping, and it's a little less crowded. Um, Last weekend when I was in the, the grocery store, I was trying to think of how I stay safer or as safe as I can. Uh, I'm used to picking up vegetables and looking at them and putting them back down and stuff and picking up cans and reading them. I think in this situation, you want to touch as little as possible, figure out what you want and pick it up and put it in the cart. Avoid touching your face. I mean, this is not just for in the grocery store, but anywhere else. And I've become much more conscious of how often I touch my, my face. Um, and I don't know about this washable mittens thing. It's something I thought of, and maybe I'll try to find a pair. Out of the house. Um, this is, is an easier task. Out in the great outdoors, as long as you maintain distance, at least six feet from other individuals, this is great because the great outdoors dissipates everything. So walking around the neighborhood is fine. I would avoid 
public parks and playgrounds because uh, they tend to be gathering places. And certainly, uh, regardless of whether you have an underlying condition or not, don't go out if you are sick, please. I'm uh, going to talk about a couple things about protecting yourself, virus survival, first of all, and then a little bit about masks. Um, hoping not to confuse you, but there's been a lot in the lay press about how long the virus survives outside the body. The big take home here is that some of this is what we're seeing with testing, is a test using a, a technique called PCR. That's just looking for fragments of the virus. That doesn't mean that someone has full virus that they can spread to other people. This was a test done recently looking at different surfaces, aerosols, copper, cardboard, stainless steel, um, and uh, plastic, uh, showing how long it persists on different surfaces, the live virus. This might be more helpful, it's called a violin plot, although you have to use your imagination to believe that's a violin. This is about the half-life. How long does it take the virus to concentration, the amount of virus to go down by half? Uh, so the lower these things are on the graph, the faster they go away. So an aerosol, somebody sneezes, Half-life is about an hour, uh, so in an hour, about half of the virus is left. That doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to pick it up and get sick from it. Other substances like stainless steel or plastic, it maybe lasts a little longer. That's really all we know. We don't know how easy it is to contract the disease from surfaces. It's probably pretty tough. Probably our main risk is getting it from directly from other individuals. What about masks? So these are the different kinds of N95 masks. Uh, this is from the movie Contagion, but believe it or not, if you have several thousand dollars and can find somebody selling uh, these types of things, you can get one. I think for the moment, uh, Having someone as a routine wear a mask out in public is not likely to help. Uh, if it's a sick individual who needs to go out, say, to seek health care, I think it's worthwhile putting a mask or even a bandana on that individual so that they don't uh, are less likely to spread their infection to somebody else. But to protect you from getting infection, uh, the jury's still out. But Probably not that helpful. Uh, crystal ball, my crystal ball has a few smudges on it. Uh, I've already alluded to, I don't know when this is going to go away. Uh, what we're hoping is that it can behave like other respiratory viruses and maybe less in the summer months, but I don't know. Treatment, there are lots of trials ongoing. And there's been a lot in the late press that I think is cause some panic buying and subscribing. Uh, we still don't really know what is uh, going to be an effective treatment for this virus, but we may know in another month or two have some better ideas. Vaccine takes longer, and one of the main things is after, even after we begin full phase testing and a lot of individuals, we have to wait to see if the vaccine produces antibodies, and that takes a few weeks. So, you, and then we have to see how long does the antibody last? Uh, does it last a few months? Does it last a year? So there are a lot of things, uh, just from a practical standpoint, that delay vaccine development. But I'm hopeful by a year from now, something will be available. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but there are a lot of interesting websites that show you how the virus has spread uh, across the country. Uh, there are also minor differences, the different colors or different uh, genetic patterns of the COVID-19 virus. 
Um, but actually, they're all pretty similar, and that bodes well for a vaccine. The virus isn't changing that much so far. Um, here's what you can do best. You've heard about flattening the curve, social distancing, at least six feet from other individuals, washing hands, try not to touch your face, uh, disinfect surfaces, uh, hygiene for sneezing and coughing, getting your plan together, and take a little advantage of time you have to spend with your family when you're cooped up at home with them. These are just three slides that I won't go into, but are resource, internet resources that um, are uh, might be useful or might be interesting for some of you. And now I'm going to transition to Dr. Friedman um, and leave you with uh, a painting by Dr. Goodsell, who's both a uh, microbiologist and a great artist and transition over to Dr. Friedman, who also wears two hats as a clinical psychologist and as a caregiver for a young man uh, with a rare disease. And Al, please take it from here. Well, thank you very much, Fred. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Al Friedman. I'm located just outside of Philadelphia. I'm very honored to be part of today's panel. What I'm planning to discuss today is why change is so stressful and uncomfortable for all of us, why I believe that we as a rare disease community are really well prepared for this crisis, focusing on what we can control. There's so many things about this situation that don't feel in our control, but I think focusing on what we can control can be very helpful. And along with that, I'm going to talk about fear distancing strategies, as I call them, for managing our stress and our anxiety. And I, I believe also that our community can be a model for others. And I'm going to finish by touching on that. This drastic change in our lives is very uncomfortable for all of us. Because of this pandemic, our sense of safety obviously feels threatened. So it's very common uh, for people to have a wide range of very strong feelings in reaction to such an unusual disruption in our lives. Uh, many of my own clients have experienced a wide range of feelings, including feelings of uh, disbelief or denial. This isn't real, Dr. Al. It, it can't really be happening. Feeling of anxiety. I'm really scared. When people get busy and charge of the situation and responding and getting things done, they feel more in control. Feelings of control come in. And, and some people, and sometimes we're able to look past the immediate crisis to the future because the problem won't last forever. It will pass eventually. I'd like us to think of these emotions not as steps we go through in a specific order or sequence, but as we try to adjust to this abrupt change, our feeling states are more like rooms in our house. We, we move between these feelings in no particular order. An important point for today is that we do have the power to influence how much time we spend with each of these feeling states and emotions, just as we have the power to move in and out of rooms in our house. On one hand, I believe our rare disease community um, as, it, as understandably, we feel extremely physically vulnerable. But on the other hand, our community is in a very strong position to understand and manage the feelings that come with this crisis. As, as Dr. Summers said, we, we have a lot of practice with some of what's happening right now. We have practice and experience with unexpected change and surprises. Many of us remember the day our lives were flipped upside down by the diagnosis of a rare disease. I certainly will never forget that day with my, my young son. We have experienced living with uncertainty. Many in our community have lived with uncertainty about our futures or our family members' futures for months or years or even decades um, prior to this public health crisis. And we also, unfortunately, uh, many of us have experience with isolation. Uh, which might be helpful right now, 
Some are very medically fragile in our community and have always needed to be careful of exposure to other people's illnesses. And many of us have never been able to do all the things other families can do. So we have practice um, more than most people for a situation like that. Because of that, I'd like to suggest that we in the rare disease community are experts at facing challenges and adversity. We know how to adapt. We are resourceful, we're creative, we're resilient, we're hopeful, and we know how to face complicated challenges. I believe that all of this will help us and serve us well as we're moving through this very difficult period. Now, having so much practice at handling the unexpected certainly helps, but the anxiety we feel is real and it's understandable, especially for those of us, and those of you who are already medically fragile, as my son is. The situation we face is frightening, so these feelings of vulnerability need to be respected. There are a lot of things about this pandemic that don't feel within our control, but I believe we can do something about the clarity of our minds, our mood, our sleep, our perception, and our thoughts, which are all related uh, to our mental health. Uh, this is really important because what this means is that we're not powerless. There are things about this situation that are in our control. So I'd like to encourage us to focus on those things that are in our control. How we take care of ourselves is in our control. It's important that we get enough sleep and that we try to maintain healthy eating patterns and nutrition. It's important that we allow sunlight and fresh air into our living spaces and that we spend time outside if we can safely. If you can get outdoors, it will make a big difference. And exercise as much as you're able to, however you can, and whatever that means for you, indoors or out. We have that control. We have the control also to pay attention to our minds and our bodies with meditation, with relaxation exercises, and with thinking exercises based on what we call cognitive behavioral therapy in my field. It's very important to do the best we can to think positive thoughts at a time like this and to uh, rest and relax as much as possible. How we stay connected with other people is in our control. I'm really not fond of the phrase, uh, the phrase uh, social distancing. Uh, to be safe and healthy, I believe we need to combine physical distancing with a lot of social connectedness. It's important to stay in close contact right now with friends and family, and it's a good time to reconnect with old friends too. I would encourage us all to use technology, as we are today, to stay connected with others. Uh, video chatting helps us feel socially connected. Uh, you might discover, as I have in this past couple of weeks, how easy it is to connect with others using video technology. Um, and it may not be something you've used before. My entire counseling and consulting practice has gone online. Telehealth for my clients and video conference chats uh, for the support groups I facilitate are working very, very well, much more so than I expected. The social connectedness is important, and how we stay connected to others is in our control. How we make choices about the use of our time is also in our control. Uh, this, this virus is very contagious, obviously, and so is fear. So we need to use what I'd like to call fear distancing strategies to help ourselves and to support our mental health. I think it's very important for us to limit our exposure to the news. I, I think it's fine to get the information we need to know to keep ourselves safe. Information that you need to know to stay safe is helpful. But if we have too much news exposure, it's going to trigger fear and anxiety, and that's not going to be helpful. I would encourage us to keep news intake to a minimum, and I'd recommend avoiding news at night just before bedtime. I also think it's important to focus on things other than this virus so that you can take breaks from thinking about it. Enjoy some mindless uh, movies or TV shows, read a good book, uh, enjoy time with your family doing anything that's entertaining and fun. We need to take breaks 
and give ourselves the rest from the worry that we're experiencing right now. That's in our control. And, and also it'll help to create and maintain a routine. If we keep to familiar routine, it'll help us feel more comfortable and it'll help us feel more in control. Uh, the routines you have may be different than the routines you used to follow, but staying consistent with how we plan and how we manage our days will help. Uh, our families affected by rare disease are often creatures of habits and routines, so we have a lot of practice for this as well. Finally, preparation and planning. Both of our doctors uh, on this webinar have talked about that. Having a health plan that you feel comfortable with, being in touch with your providers uh, to know how to reach them if you need to, using telehealth, uh, which is now available in, 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 many, uh, in many locations and with many providers. And also, if you require caregivers in your home, as my son does, uh, it's important to put precautions in place to reduce risks to you and to your caregivers. You'll feel uh, more in control if you're clear about what you expect, and the caregiver will feel, feel more in control if they feel protected as well. All of these strategies are in our control. Focus on what is in our control. We can help others by being examples in the rare disease community. We know this virus is very contagious, but I've, I've also learned from my experience, both as a parent and as a helping professional in the rare disease community, there are a lot of other things in life that can also be contagious. A positive attitude can be contagious. My son has a positive attitude every day. Resilience can be contagious. Having hope can be contagious. And being grateful for every single day is contagious. Gratitude goes a long way. I know from my years being a part of this community and supporting other families in my work that our community is not only prepared to face this challenge, but to model uh, for others what it means to face adversity with great grace and dignity. Finish up now by sharing a couple of uh, resources that I have found very helpful uh, supporting our mental health. Uh, these will be posted on the NORB uh, website very soon, so you'll be able to uh, refer back to these links. And the apps listed on the bottom are meditation apps that are very helpful, easy to access, and a couple of them are offering uh, content at no cost uh, during this pandemic. I want to finish by saying thank you for the privilege of serving on serving the community by participating on the panel today. And I'd like to wish everyone who's listening uh, today good health and, and happiness as we all move through this very complicated time together. Thank you. Back to Katie. So thank you, Dr. Summer, Dr. Wiederman, Dr. Friedman, for, for those really great presentations. Um, we have collected questions from participants during the registration and also during this live webinar. And we'll now move to the Q&A session. And there are a lot of questions, so I'm just going to go for it and jump right in. So um, first question, um, if I may, Dr. Summer, um, ask you, um, one of our um, listeners writes, I'm afraid to go to the hospital, but my rare disease sometimes puts me in urgent medical crises that force me to go to the ER or talk to my doctor. How do I decide if the risk of coronavirus infection is worth going to the hospital? That's a great question, and it's one we're getting asked a lot. So here's how I think you should handle this. First off, a lot of hospitals are working to separate patients. So patients who are being screened for COVID are going one way. Patients who are not are going another way. So that's your first level of protection. The next is you're probably in more danger not treating your rare disease properly than you are from COVID, even if you were to contract COVID. And if I jump in and contradict me on that, if not, but some of our rare diseases have quite significant medical complications. Also, work with your medical team. 
don't sit home and try to guess this one out alone. If you need to, call them up, walk through it, talk through it. If there are things you can do at home to take care of it, great. But if you need to go in, don't be scared to go in. I mean, there are things, um, there are lots of things being done to try to protect you. I mean, patients who are getting infusions, um, we take a lot of precautions there. So I think it's safe to go in. I think particularly if it's going to compromise your disease, don't, don't let fear guide you there. Great. Thank you. Very helpful. Um, so, Dr. Wiederman, we have a whole constellation of questions from um, people who registered for the webinar and are listening and are immunocompromised. And um, the questions are asking, really, you know, how can people with immune disorders protect themselves? Uh, and they're saying, what if a family member leaves the house? So, like, you know, what if, what if the mother's a nurse but the child has a, an immune disorder? Or, or, or what about uh, immunocompromised people who have, you know, essential workers coming into their house? So if you could just um, maybe say a few words about how immunocompromised people can stay protected and, and, and their access to other people. Uh, sure. Um, you know, one of my practice concentrations is children who have received heart or kidney Transplant. So I have a lot of children with uh, immune compromised uh, in my practice. Um, uh, as has been stated previously, in general, so far, children seem to have it better than adults. Um, it's been difficult so far because um, there are lots of different ways the immune system can be compromised, either by medications or underlying diseases, things like that. And so they're, they're all a little bit different. Uh, just about an hour before we went out the air, the Centers for Disease Control released uh, some more information about uh, underlying health conditions and their outcomes with COVID-19. Um, now, they were all individuals 19 years of age or older, so this doesn't really apply to children. Um, but among the, the individuals that they've been able to look at uh, uh, in detail, they had complete information on about 7,000 individuals uh, reported to the CDC. And only 264 of those had an immunocompromised condition. Um, and I was a little encouraged by that. It, it wasn't a bigger chunk of the pie. Uh, I was expecting more. Still, it's a small number. Of those 264 immunocompromised people that they had information on, uh, a little over half, 140 of them were not hospitalized at all. They didn't need hospitalization. Of the ones who were hospitalized, um, about 60% of them did not require intensive care services, and 40% uh, did receive an ICU admission. Um, so, uh, again, uh, Honestly, not as bad as I thought. And I think to, to reiterate what Dr. Sumer said, um, you know, I think you should take care of, uh, your, your underlying rare disease, manage us for that. You can always call ahead to an, uh, ED, emergency department or wherever you're going and say, gee, I've got this condition, is there any way uh, you could fast track me uh, once I register? And again, most most facilities are screening up front for respiratory symptoms or anything that sounds like COVID-19. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Friedman, I have a question that uh, about 
supporting patients. They say, can you offer advice on how to support patients and support groups all over the country have, have been canceled? Sure. That's a great question, Katie. What I'm seeing is that the in-person support groups at a local level, in many cases, are being replaced by online support groups, sometimes at a national level. There are new groups online popping up every day. Uh, for some rare disease groups, these are being created and formulated now and haven't been announced yet. So I'd recommend that, that everyone check with the national rare disease organization that you're connected with uh, to look for online support groups. There are also a lot of informal support groups springing up on Facebook and other social media. And uh, I'm also noticing I'm using uh, Zoom video conference technology, which is free and it's easy to use. So if there aren't other options, uh, many people are initiating contact with other families that they know and starting their own informal group using Zoom technology. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that is very much. Thank you. And and I'll add, um, you know, I know that we're adding more and more information from our member organizations to the NORD website. I saw an ad, one of our member organizations called Our Odyssey was announcing um, support groups during the pandemic for young people. And, and I'm sure there are others out there, and, and NORD will be trying to make that information available. Dr. Summer, I wonder if you might take this on, uh, just as we had a number of questions about immunocompromised people, we have a large number of questions from infusion-dependent patients. And so they're asking about your advice for people who require infusions and um, a lot of curiosity about whether it's safer to go to the hospital uh, or, or doing uh, in-home in infusions. So thanks. That's a that's another good question. We actually are actually I've got two infusions going on here at the hospital right now. What we're recommending is that you maintain your regular pattern. If you've got an infusion team you're used to working with, you're probably going to have less confusion, less problems around getting the medications to the right place if you work with the infusion pattern you're currently doing. If that's at the hospital, I'd probably continue doing that. If that's at home, the same thing there. Because as most of you know, these can take a while to set up, and trying to make a, a jump in midstream right now in the middle of all this would be tough to do, and those infusions are very important. And, and I also think that the risk is not going to, um, of COVID is not going to outweigh the risk of missing your infusion. So I, I'd keep your regular pattern now. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bounce back to you, Dr. Friedman, because this is a question I'm getting over and over again from the rare disease community, but I think that people, even if not in the rare disease community, would be curious um, to hear your response. And it's basically, how can I stay busy and unstressed when I'm here at home all day, every day? Thanks, Katie. Uh, that's a great question, and it's true for the rare disease community and everybody else. We're all facing the same challenge. I, my suggestion is to plan your day. To We should all make a list of things that we want to do and that we can do and that we need to do to keep busy and to keep productive. And from that list, I'd recommend making a, a schedule, as I had mentioned during the presentation, having a routine and patterns to follow with your day is going to help using a list of things that you want to do, can do, need to do, make a schedule and follow it. Um, I'm not sure if others are experiencing this as I am, but the time is actually moving faster than I expected um, because I am following a schedule and, and keeping busy. Uh, I'd also recommend a balance of work time and relaxation time as you would under normal conditions. The key thing is having things to do being conscious and intentional about allocating time for them and following whatever plan you can make to help yourself keep in routine. Oh, that's a, I think that's terrific advice. Um, so 
uh, Dr. Wiedemann, um, you alluded to this in your presentation, but uh, it's another commonly asked question. So, so I'm going to go ahead and, and ask. Um, so one of our listeners writes, can my husband continue to stroll around our suburban neighborhood safely in his electric wheelchair as long as we maintain a safe distance from other people? Uh, yeah, thanks for uh, this question giving me a chance to elaborate a little more on that. Uh, absolutely. Maintain a safe distance. But when you think about it, out out in the in the air, um, things dissipate rapidly. Um, so things, you know, if any virus that might have been in the air or something from a person who passed by a little earlier is long gone. Uh, so that really is a very safe environment. Uh, you know, if you're if you're a little worried about that, uh, you know, you can certainly, uh, when you get back home, sort of rinse off, clean the the wheels of the wheelchair, things like that. But but in general, uh, it's good to get out if you can. As I said, just if you're sick, we we don't want you out there. That that makes great sense. And, and if you don't mind, just one more follow-up. Um, uh, you did show a slide showing, you know, the virus living on different services, surfaces. Um, but one um, listener writes, can coronavirus be transmitted via fabric service surfaces? So should I be worried about having the virus on my clothing and my shoes? Well, it's uh, – they didn't look too much at – at that particular surface. So at this point, it's a theoretic concern. Um, part of this, and what I didn't go into on those on those slides, there were two different colors. One was for the old SARS virus. Uh, so it mostly showed that the old SARS virus and this one are pretty similar in how it survives. And although that uh, epidemic only lasted six months, we have some information on how easily it was transmitted to others. And it seems like transmission from inanimate objects, surfaces, and things must have been a, a pretty unusual circumstance. Um, you know, if something's visibly soiled or wet, things are going to survive longer. The virus will survive longer. Uh, if you're concerned, and, and some physicians are doing this, they're changing clothes, uh, leaving their work clothes outside the door or uh, changing out of clothes before they leave the hospital. I'm not sure if that does anything, but it's, uh, you know, an option. But I, um, we don't know for sure, but I, I think that's going to be a very unusual way to pick up the virus. Okay, terrific. Um, okay, we are getting low on time. I'm going to squeeze in two more questions. Um, first, for Dr. Summer, uh, the community is asking, do you know of rare disease cases that are testing positive for COVID? Have you, have you seen any? And if so, do you have any idea if there are more children or adults impacted? It's another great question. The audience has really got some good ones today. What I can tell you at our hospital right now today, and this can change in a heartbeat, none of our rare disease patients are testing positive for COVID. But I work in a children's hospital and see a younger uh, pediatric population. In our older group of patients, because we do follow adults as well, I don't have any reports yet. I think this is why the um, separation and shelter rules are so important because we want our adults are who I'm actually really, really worried about. But in our hospital itself, we actually don't have any COVID positive rare disease patients, and we have a number of patients in the hospital right now. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, you have one of the premier rare disease treatment centers in the country. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you aren't seeing cases yet. 
and, and agreed that we all need to follow the guidelines that are in place so we can flatten the curve and, and protect the older population. Um, and so last question, I'm going to go to you, Dr. Friedman, um, on something about supporting rare disease patients, uh, because that's what we're all here to do. So the question is, what are your recommendations on how to support rare disease patients with valuable information without adding to all the panic and noise? It's a great question, Katie, for obvious reasons. I think the key, as I as I had mentioned uh, earlier, is, is consider what rare disease patients need to know to keep safe. Um, and keep it simple by providing practical information that we can act on as family members and people with rare diseases to keep safe. To not send news items that might be more frightening, but to focus on concrete information that can be used in a practical sense and that we can feel empowered by so that we feel in control more than out of control in the situation. I also think it's important to, as, as uh, Dr. Summer said earlier, to, to be positive through the face of this challenging situation and any information you share that it comes along with a sense of hope. Uh, many of us in this community have made it through some very difficult and complicated medical situations prior to this crisis. We are strong, and we can do this. So I think we can be best supported, our community, by providing information that will help us feel empowered, help us feel safe, and give us information and information that uh, provides us direction on what we can do that helps us be and feel in control. Oh, thank you for that terrific answer and, and, and really sending a positive message to this resilient community at, you know, at this time. Um, so I want to remind everybody that we're going to be sending the slides uh, out to everybody who registered for the webinar. Um, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Summer, Dr. Wiedemann, Dr. Friedman, for, for being with us today, for taking time from your, you know, incredibly busy clinical schedule to, to speak to this rare audience today. Um, after the webinar, everybody's going to receive a short survey, and, and I'd like to encourage you to please complete it because it'll help us develop future webinars, in, including those related to COVID-19. So thank you, everyone, for, enjoy, for joining us, and please enjoy the rest of your day.